Raise your hand if you've ever touched an electrical fence or accidentally stuck your finger in a light socket. Uh, it was jolting, wasn't it? Uh, you, could, you could feel electricity, if you're like me, in every cell of your body, from head to toe. Uh, it was a sensation that took your breath away and really, really got your attention, wasn't it? Well, I'm here today because of something that happened to me a few years ago that was very much like that. And it led to an epiphany, or if, if that sounds too spiritual for you, to an aha moment. And it caused me to, to change the direction of my life, uh, to actually and very consciously redesign it. Uh, let me tell you about it. I, um, I, I'm going to have to take you back to about five years, to July of 2007, uh, when I was still head of corporate communications at Cigna. And um, I want to take you to Kingsport, Tennessee, where I grew up. Uh, I had decided to take a few days off from my job um, and fly from Philadelphia, where I worked and where I still live, uh, to, to go back to Kingsport to visit my folks. While I was there, I picked up the, the local newspaper. I'd actually worked for that newspaper as an intern many years before. And I read a front page story about something called a healthcare expedition that was being held a few miles away. Uh, actually a few miles north of Kingsport at a, at a county fairgrounds in Wise County, Virginia. The story said that thousands of people were expected to drive from as far away as Ohio and Georgia and South Carolina. Some were expected to drive 500 miles to this health care expedition. The paper said that uh, it was being put on by this organization called Remote Area Medical, based in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, started by a guy, a British actor, former actor called Stan, Stan Brock, who uh, organized this or started this, uh, uh, this remote area medical to fly doctors from um, the U.S. to remote areas around the world, starting uh, in, in villages where he used to live in South America. He, he, uh, his acting career was largely uh, on wild Omaha, I guess it was a, uh, Wild Kingdom, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom many years ago. And he lived in, in, for many years in remote villages of the Amazon. Um, so he, but after he left, he decided he wanted to do something for those he had lived with. He knew that their, uh, their villages were so remote that almost none of them ever had any accident, access to good health care. So he eventually did start Remote Area Medical to fly U.S. doctors to the Amazon and later to Africa and, and uh, more recently to Haiti and other, other places where people just do not have access to good care. Um, it turned out that... Uh, Pretty soon, people started finding out what he was doing, and uh, he started getting calls from uh, uh, places in the United States, including from a county very close to where I grew up, Hancock County, Tennessee, which is uh, one of the most beautiful places in the country, but also one of the most one of the poorest. Uh, and they were asking him if he might consider taking an expedition from uh, not to Haiti, not to uh, South America, but to Hancock County, Tennessee, because uh, they didn't have, the people there didn't have very good access to health care, and especially dental care. So Stan Brock loaded up a truck, uh, got some dentists from Knoxville, Tennessee to go with him, uh, some dental equipment, and that was the beginning of what has become uh, expeditions that go throughout this country. Uh, now remote area medical uh, goes primarily to places in the U.S. Uh, because of our crazy health care system here. I was so intrigued by the story that I read in the paper that I decided to uh, borrow my dad's 1992 Oldsmobile and drive the 50 miles through the winding uh, Highway 23 through the, through the Appalachian Mountains up to Wise County. I was intrigued because at that time I was writing what would be used as a public policy document, uh, a white paper about the problem of the uninsured, or at least the problem from the perspective of the health insurance industry, the people that I worked with and worked for. The objective of that paper was to persuade people that this problem was not such a big deal after all. Uh, certainly not such a big deal that it would require a big government solution. So keep in mind that this was in 2007 and the campaigns for president were underway and all the, at least all the Democratic candidates were, were talking about the need for health care reform. I would not have admitted this then, but uh, I was using certain statistics uh, very selectively and out of context to make the argument in this policy paper 
uh, that I was writing that many, if not most, of the 50 million Americans who are uninsured are that way by choice. That they are just shirking their responsibility to themselves and to their families by not buying health insurance. One of the things that most intrigued me about what I read in the newspaper was that John Edwards, who at this time was still a contender for the Democratic nomination, was going to be making a campaign stop at that very expedition in Wise County. And this obviously was before John Edwards' meltdown. Uh, I realized, though, if John Edwards was going to be there, this was a pretty big deal. So early the next morning, which was a Saturday morning, I, uh, I, I set out for, for Wise County before, before dawn. And I actually got there before the sun uh, came up because I had read that people were expected to line up uh, hours before daybreak, and they were. They had done that. Uh, and, and when I got there, uh, I don't think any, there's anything that could have prepared me for what I, what I saw. The parking lot was absolutely jam-packed with, with cars and, and, and trucks. And um, uh, I found out later that many people had slept in them overnight, some for two or three nights, uh, just to be able to get a number. They were passing out numbers uh, because there was only a certain number of people that could get in uh, the fairgrounds on each of these three days. Uh, and if they didn't make it on the first day, they would sleep in the cars or the trucks and hope that they'd get in the next day. But by the time I got there, most people were already on the inside. And I really couldn't sit, see what was going on on the other side of the fairground gates until, obviously, I walked through it. And when I did, I saw something that I never would have expected to see in the United States. I saw people who were uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who were lined up uh, in the soaking rain. They were, they were actually uh, they were soaking wet. Uh, and, they were, and I realized that uh, uh, the lines that they were in led, in many cases, to barns and animal stalls. Um, and I realized also that um, the moment that I took that scene in, that what I was doing for a living was contributing to the circumstances that, that made it necessary for those people to stand in line to get medical care in, 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 a, in barns and animal stalls. I, I knew at that moment that I, I had to, to make some changes in, in what I was doing. And, uh, and I realized that for some reason fate had taken me there. Um, I, I made a decision, I made a, a pledge to myself that I, uh, I would do something other than what I was doing. I was spinning for the health insurance industry. I realized that I was, in many cases, misleading the public, making, trying to make people believe things that were not true, just so that when the health care reform debate started, uh, that people would not think that reform was all that necessary. When I got back to Philadelphia, though, I, uh, I went back to my job. Uh, I, I knew that I wanted to leave, but, but I didn't think that I would ever have the nerve to just walk away from a good-paying job. And then a, a few weeks later, I um, was uh, asked to fly with the CEO from Philadelphia to Connecticut, where Cigna has big, uh, a lot of offices. I'd done this many times. Uh, and um, this trip was different, though. For the first time, I was just really paying attention to what was going on. And I noticed that... Um, uh, on this fairly short trip, it was around lunchtime, so uh, we, were, uh, uh, we were having lunch on a plane, and we had a, a flight attendant. This was a private company plane, a flight attendant, who, and it was just the CEO, CEO and me on this flight. Uh, she came and she uh, uh, brought us our lunch on, uh, on, on China that was uh, gold rim, and we were given uh, gold-plated flatware to eat it with. And I, I realized that um, uh, we were able to do that uh, because of the way that these companies, my company and others, use premium dollars. And that uh, the things that we were doing, the way we were using people's premium dollars, uh, we were con uh, and, 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 and the way we were traveling, uh, we were really uh, making or contributing to the crisis in healthcare in this country. And I realized that many people were having to go without coverage, were having to line up to get care in animal stalls, in barns, and uh, uh, in, in close to where I grew up, and could have been relatives of mine, just because of the way we were spending that money. So a few months later, I, uh, I decided to quit my job. I, I didn't have another one lined up, so I I was taking a very big risk, and I, but, but I knew that I, I could no longer keep serving as a spokesman for the health insurance industry. I knew that if I stayed in my job, I would be expected to play a role in defeating health care reform, as I had in years past. 
uh, starting back uh, in the, in the uh, 1990s uh, during the uh, effort that uh, President and Mrs. Clinton made to try to reform the health care system. I played a, a lead role, uh, frankly, behind the scenes in helping to defeat the, the Clinton health care reform plan. And a few, laters, a few years later, when uh, lawmakers were trying to pass something called a Patients' Bill of Rights that actually had bipartisan support. Uh, it was co-sponsored in the Senate by John McCain and, and Ted Kennedy. But insurance companies didn't want it to pass because of a provision that would have uh, uh, broadened the ability of people to sue their health insurance companies and their employers if they were uh, inappropriately or wrongly denied coverage. I just didn't have, the, the, I just didn't have it in me to, uh, to be a part of yet another effort to defeat health care reform, so I left. After I left, I, thank you. After I left, I, I, I did some consulting for a while, and, um, and I began to pay really close attention to uh, the campaigns and, and what the candidates were saying, uh, in particular about health care reform. Uh, and I frankly was, um, even though I was raised as a Republican, I was frankly uh, very happy that a Democrat was elected president because I knew that the chances of uh, meaningful health care reform being enacted were much greater if uh, one of the Democratic candidates were elected. And I paid close attention to, um, uh, after Barack Obama took office, to how the, in the health care reform debate was, was taking shape in Washington. And I began to get worried because, um, uh, because of what I had been doing. I could, I could tell what my former colleagues were doing behind the scenes to um, try to either kill reform or shape the legislation as it worked its way through Congress. On March the 5th, 2009, President Obama, you know, this obviously just about two months after he took office, uh, had a, a health care reform summit at the White House. And he invited health care reform advocates and, uh, and, and, and union leaders, but also leaders of the, uh, of the special interests, the industries. Uh, that would be so effective at health care reform, the hospitals, the, the doctors, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, and of course the insurance companies. And among them was uh, the CEO of America's Health Insurance Plans, Karen Ignati, who I, I know very well. Uh, at the end of the summit, uh, while the, the cameras were rolling, Karen got up and, and said to the president, Mr. President, you can count on us, uh, the insurance companies, to, uh, uh, to work with you, to make a good faith effort to pass health care reform. Well, I knew that was disingenuous. Uh, and I knew that what was going on was a, uh, uh, a bifurcated effort, uh, a duplicitous uh, campaign uh, to, uh, to, to, for the industry to say one thing, but behind the scenes to be doing something entirely different. Uh, they were saying uh, that we're with you, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna be wearing the white hats this time, but uh, in reality, what was going on behind the scenes was uh, an effort to undermine reform. Later, we, 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 we found out that the insurance industry was funneling many millions of dollars to uh, its allies, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in 2009 and 2010, the insurance industry funneled $100 million to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce alone to help finance the Chamber's anti-health care reform uh, initiative. I became so outraged with what was going on that I... Uh, uh, I, I began thinking seriously for the first time about doing something publicly to call attention to what I knew that the industry was doing. And also about exactly how private insurance companies have contributed to skyrocketing health care costs and the ever-increasing number of Americans without insurance. But despite my anger, despite feeling this outrage, I still was very afraid to do anything publicly. Uh, keep in mind, I had worked for these companies. I, 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 and I knew how much money was at stake here and how, how much they wanted to influence reform to make it, if it had to happen at all, uh, to protect their profits. Uh, and I had seen and even been a part of efforts in the past to, um, to, to discredit the industry's critics and to uh, try to ruin their careers of anyone who spoke against them. Um, so I probably wouldn't be here today if, if during this time I uh, hadn't uh, picked up a book that I bought many, many, many years ago. I hadn't looked at in many years. Uh, Profiles and Courage by, by, by President John Kennedy. Uh, and I, uh, I began to flip through it and I, I looked at, I really hadn't read the foreword before. It was written by uh, Robert Kennedy, 
um, about his brother after his brother had, had died. This was an edition that was published after his death. And he said that one of the president's uh, favorite quotes was one by um, uh, the Italian poet and philosopher Dante, uh, who wrote many, many years ago that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. Well, folks, that did it for me. Uh, I, I realized that this was uh, my next epiphany, uh, my next aha moment, if you will. Uh, I, I knew that uh, I had to take a big risk, that, that I, was, I was getting a message that I had to do this. Otherwise, I uh, had to do something. I, otherwise, I, I was going to be uh, uh, spending, the hottest, spending eternity in the hottest places in hell. So now you know why I really did this. Uh, not so much literally... Um, but I began thinking, uh, this made me think about the end of my life. Uh, and I started to, uh, uh, to, 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 to see myself at the end of my life and, 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 and wondering what I would be thinking if I hadn't done what I thought was the right thing. So I began reaching out to some healthcare reform advocates that I'd read about, uh, some that I actually knew personally. Uh, and that... Um, eventually led to me being invited to testify before Congress. Uh, I uh, uh, was invited to testify by Senator John Rockefeller before his uh, Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, which was holding hearings on uh, health care reform on June the 24th, 2009. I agreed to do it. And I will tell you that that was the scariest day of my life because I knew that when I was through testifying, my life was going to be changing forever. Um, this is how I introduced myself. My name is Wendell Potter, and for 20 years I worked as a senior executive at health insurance companies, and I saw how they confuse their customers and dump the sick, all so they can satisfy their Wall Street investors. I told the senators that insurance companies routinely cancel people's coverage when they get critically ill, just so they can avoid paying medical claims. And I described how they refuse uh, uh, routinely to sell policies to people because of a pre-existing condition. And I described a practice that's known in the industry called purging. And this is a, a practice in which insurance companies, and this, this is primarily in the small uh, business world, uh, when the employee, when an employee or a de dependent of an employee, a child of an employee gets sick, uh, the, uh, and the insurance company has to pay quite a, a lot in medical claims, when that policy comes up for renewal, the insurance company will typically jack up the rates so much that the small business uh, often will have to drop coverage for everybody or start shifting much more of the cost of care uh, from uh, the employer to the employee. And then the hope is, of course, that uh, uh, the rates will be so high that the, uh, uh, the business will just go away. That's why it's, why it's called purging. I also explained how insurance companies were under constant pressure from their shareholders and Wall Street analysts to... Uh, keep spending less and less of the premiums that we pay on, on our medical care. I've been told that my testimony had an impact on the reform legislation, uh, that what I said resulted in some of the uh, provisions of the, the law being included in what we call Obamacare. Um, the law, for example, makes it illegal now for an insurance company to um, just cancel someone's coverage when they get sick unless there is some evidence of fraud. And it uh, will eventually make it uh, unlawful for insurance companies to refuse to sell coverage to us uh, just because we've been sick in the past. And it, it contains a requirement that insurance companies um, now have to spend at least 80% of what we pay in premiums on our, on our medical care. Despite those good things, though, the law, I think as we most, most of us would acknowledge, uh, uh, fell far short of, of getting us to universal coverage in this country. And it, it, it won't do enough uh, to get us, uh, to, to get costs into control as we all had hoped or I had hoped uh, at the beginning of the debate on health care reform. And that is because the special interests in Washington uh, are still very much in control. We Americans are, are, are frankly under the illusion that, um, that public policy is controlled by lawmakers and the president. But the reality is that decisions on public policy are controlled largely by big corporations and their, their lobbyists and a very few wealthy individuals whose contributions can determine the outcome of elections. So the health care reform law that we got was worth passing, in my opinion. It does some very good things, but it, um, 
um, it, it, what we really needed was a, a redesign of uh, what we call a healthcare system in this country. Uh, it's not so much a system as most developed countries have, it's more of a sickness industry, uh, but we refer to it as a healthcare system. President Obama recognizes this. In fact, here in Chicago in 2003, he was uh, asked about reform. He said, in an ideal world, if we could start from scratch, we would have a single payer system in this country, like many other developed countries around the world, in fact, like most of them. Uh, but he said, being a pragmatist, it's not likely that we can start over. Well, I've had a, a number of other aha moments related to that, uh, what he said then, since I began redesigning my life and, and redirecting my life's work. Uh, one is that uh, the health insurance industry and other special interests will continue to control our so-called system despite the new regulations in Obamacare until the public and lawmakers become aware of just how much my former colleagues are still in control uh, and how our day-to-day -day lives, our day, our day -to -day, how their day-to-day -day decisions um, have life and death consequences uh, eventually for all of us. Another aha moment I've had is that we will never get the reforms we need in healthcare or in banking or the environment or anything else for that matter unless we address something else. And that's the corrosive effect of money in politics. Back during the 1960s when John Kennedy was president, there were uh, about 300 lobbyists in Washington. Today there are 13,000. And the money that's being spent to influence the way that we vote in this coming November and to shape public policy uh, will be well over a billion dollars just this year alone. So I'm continuing to redesign my life and, and redirect my life's work. And in addition to continuing to speak and, and write about um, health care and to get this project off the ground I just mentioned, I'm also supporting the work of a, of a fairly new nonpartisan organization called United Republic. The goal of the United Republic uh, uh, is to get, get us to a place where the will and concerns of the people are not drowned out by the financial influence of the few, where politicians devote more time to their constituents than to their fundraising, where political decisions uh, are made on principle without the distorting effect of lobbyists, and where individual citizens have access to clear information about their leaders and are empowered to end the imbalance of power in Washington and our interstate capitals. This might seem like something that is just simply uh, pie in the sky. This can't be possible. But I'm confident that it is possible, but only if more of us have something akin to an aha moment about what is really happening in our country and our democracy and our way of life and decide not to, not to maintain our neutrality. If we don't do that, if we don't get off the sidelines and, and redesign, frankly, the, the way that candidates get elected in this country and public policy gets made, if we don't do that, I'm, I'm afraid that our democracy will disappear uh, and that many of us will eventually be keeping each other company in those hottest places in hell that Dante warned us about. So my parting plea is that you always keep the end in mind. And by that, I mean the end of your life in mind. And uh, whenever you have an aha moment, act on it, especially if, um, uh, if it feels like you just stuck your finger in a light socket, uh, because that's a sign that uh, you, need, you need to act, uh, or at least to help design something or redesign something of social significance. Please don't pass up any opportunities to leave the world a better place. Thank you.